conditions. Got it. So, you know, I think uh, what would you tell the drivers who are sort of maybe more in that 30 to 40 to 50 hour a week camp right now that are, you know, like as your own studies have pointed out, you know, they're in a minority, you know, a very small um, number of drivers. They're, they're doing a decent chunk of work, but, uh, you know, they're sort of, you know, I kind of feel like a lot of them are working kind of like employees, but without any of the benefits. And they're obviously a lot of the ones on the front lines of AB5 and pushing for employees. So what would you kind of tell them, um, you know, w w what would you tell them if you were talking to them directly and like, how should they swallow this pill, for example? Well, I think that, first of all, um, even though they are working the hours, and by the way, uh, that set of drivers is incredibly valuable to the platform, uh, the quality of, <laughs> of the drivers tends to be really high as well. So I, I don't want to minimize I mean, I think they're a lot more reason. valuable than someone like me who might hop onto the platform every every now and then, right? It's great for me to have that option. But, you know, I think if you had to yeah. pick, you know, me or, you know, someone who's like a lot more dedicated and loyal to the company, I hope you would not pick me. <laughs> I, I, I would, I'd pick you to uh, broadcast, I'd pick them to drive. Okay. Uh, so I think, first of all, that, that set of drivers is incredibly important to the platform. And, and what I would say is, listen, while they are working 30, 40, 50 hours a week, um, they're benefiting from being able to work exactly when they want or not want, mm -hmm. having the schedule that they want. And the way that we have structured the benefits is that the benefits accrual to them will be higher than the benefits accrual for a part-time driver. So it is, we structured in a way, they, they would be the ones who, who benefit the most. Um, and the fact is that they are a minority, mm -hmm. but they are very important to the platform. And we try to design this so that uh, they get more of a benefit because frankly they're putting in they're putting in uh, more hours right I mean I guess it's still a linear benefit but they do benefit more because they're putting in more hours more miles more trips so I guess talking about some of those other benefits that employees might typically get I imagine that you and your team had conversations about what to put in this proposal you know sort of how you decided on the benefits fund and some of these other options what maybe maybe talk about uh, an option or two that didn't make it into the proposal I guess I'm thinking of something like a minimum wage which you know has been proposed in or is happening in New York City or even collective bargaining you know sort of like what uh, the IDG the Independent Drivers Guild in New York City represents a lot of the Uber or all the Uber and Lyft drivers there uh, what are your thoughts there yeah we we did talk about a minimum earning standard and for example our prop 22 in California does include a minimum earning standard mm -hmm. And the issue with the minimum earning standard is that earning standards change, uh, as you know, earnings and minimum earnings change state by state by uh, state. And uh, a minimum earning standard can be economic in some places and can be very, very diseconomic in other places. In other words, in certain places, it would just really, really shrink the market and not make any sense. Uh, so what we opted for was transparency and you know, when I've talked to drivers in forums, uh, the drivers that I've talked to, they, they're their own boss. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, a minimum earning standard takes away from the best drivers who are very productive, who are adding, who are earning on the system, um, to drivers who are less productive, right? This, the profession itself is a profession that allows you, um, if you put in the work and you're smart about how you work and when you work and where you work, your earnings are going to be very, very healthy, and that has actually been very attractive to the to the drivers who I uh, who I've spoken to. So they were quite positive mm -hmm. on the benefits package, uh, and they said, "Listen, I'm going to you know let me earn what I want to earn. I'm my own boss, and I take responsibility for my own earnings." Yeah. That's what I've heard in terms of. Uh, the drivers who I've spoken with. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, I think, you know, talking about that Seattle earnings study that you referenced earlier, or using the Uber earnings data, you know, one of the things that immediately jumped out to me that during that one week, some drivers were actually earning over $40 an hour, and others were earning under $10 an hour, right, which just sort of highlights that, I mean, 400% variability is probably, you know, I knew that there was a lot of variability, but that surprised me a lot. And I will say it's really a lot of what my business is based on, right? I mean, I have a whole blog and YouTube channel and course because 
I think that you know with more experience and more know-how you can make more money I think the thing that I like about a minimum wage though for example is that it aligns incentives one of the complaints you know we already talked about you know drivers one of their top complaints is that they're not paid enough another complaint that I hear often from drivers is that there's too many drivers and I think this can be you know a bit selfish in that you know once you become a driver you don't want other people to get in on this great job um, because that means more rides for you but with a minimum wage like we see in New York City that's based on utilization I think the incentives are much better aligned you know Uber um, you know and other companies sort of want and need drivers to drive in the busiest places and times and you know kind of have have them understand a better picture of their earnings what are your thoughts on sort of the best way to align the incentives of the drivers and the companies like Uber I, I think that the incentives are aligned long term but I think you're right, short term, they can be misaligned. Mm -hmm. In that in that long term, uh, what we've seen all the time is, is that if earnings are on average, and these are averages, okay, and then I'll get to the, the, the variability, if earnings come down on average, then drivers fall off the platform because they'll find something else to do, and earnings go right back up to where they have been historically, and conversely, if earnings are super high, more drivers come onto the platform and earnings go down to long-term trends. So I think that incentives, the long-term of uh, the long-term incentives are aligned. Okay. Um, we are looking all the time at balancing um, the number of drivers on the road to demand. And actually you're absolutely right. During high demand periods, we need more drivers on the road. Mm -hmm. And during some low demand periods, actually we don't need as many drivers on the road. And I think we do have to do a better job of, shaping kind of mm -hmm. uh when drivers uh, drivers to know where to drive when to drive etc and i do think that we we can probably build our tools in a better way to help drivers avoid some of the volatility in their earnings um and to guide drivers to better earnings opportunities than we have historically i think that's absolutely on a short-term basis we're not where we want to be long-term i think the incentives are totally aligned got it i, I do